The Octorangery, a podcast exploring the meaning of ecology, spirit, and human relationship. From Southwestern Australia, I'm your host, Byron John. G'day Mob, welcome back to the Octarine Tree podcast. Today's episode we are talking to Monica Gagliano, an Italian-Australian author. You may have heard of, she wrote the book, Thus Spoke the Plant, which tells of her story of initiating experiments, scientific university, PhD level, I believe, experiments which showed very strong implications that plants had a capacity for mind and memory and decision making and other very interesting potentials. She has pioneered the brand new research field of plant bioacoustics and extended the concept of cognition in plants which has reignited the discourse on plant subjectivity, sentience and ethical standing. Monica is a very very engaging soul I have to say very grounded, very open-minded, and very human. Her book also covers her personal subjective story as she explored and expanded her own personal relationship with the plant queendom, the vegetal queendom, the realm of the plant. Really interesting stuff. We also discuss the concept of indigeneity, linear time, astrology, ethnobotany, science versus scientism, new and old novel epistemologies, and much, much more. This is a great chat. I really hope you enjoy Monica Galliano. Monica Galliano, welcome to the Octarine Tree podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs> You're currently in northern New South Wales, as we were discussing before I hit record. How are you finding the particular biome over there, the subtropics? Is this your first time actually living in the subtropics? Uh, Not quite. Uh, I actually lived in the tropics before. I was up in North Queensland. And then after that, we came to live on the Sunshine Coast, which is kind of like subtropical as well. Yeah. And uh, so um, this is my perfect biomes, actually. I love the lushness and the green and also the fact that it's not as extreme as the tropics can be. So, yeah. although right now it's pretty extreme, like we are flooding. So, <laughs> yeah, major floods at the moment. But yeah, you're right. The Northern Rivers region of New South Wales is uh, really special in the way that you have that subtropical growing environment. You've got ample rainfall most of the time. You know, there is Australia is pretty uh, unpredictable in its rainfall patterns. But you, I think the average is somewhere around 1,200 mil, give or take. And you've got these, mm. these hyper-fertile volcanic soils, which relative to the rest of Australia, you know, are incredible. Yep. And you do, of course, the summers are really hot and really wet and sticky. But in the valleys, you also get these cooler microclimates where you can actually get frosts. So it's actually, it's a really interesting growing environment. Yeah, I love it. It's, I love the diversity. And I think the people who end up living here uh, kind of reflect that as well. Yeah. So you got, you find a bit of everything. So Yeah, it's a very rich mix of culture and local cultures up there. In fact, mm. I reckon yeah. I have to say, I think it's probably the most food secure part of Australia that I've ever been to. Yeah. For all the reasons just, just mentioned, the growing environment, but also the type of people that it attracts are, are those who want to be growing their own food for a start. And secondly, the employment opportunities aren't great because it's quite a sparse, well, a city is a city, but outside of the cities up there, it's quite a sparse population, not a lot of work. So people have to grow their own food yep. and they do. I worked in the Shannon. That put me in contact with a lot of people over there and just going to see the systems that they had built, incredibly abundant. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I don't, I get all my food for the week from the market and it's all being produced locally and it's all fresh. And you can tell when we had too much rain or not enough rain because you can just see it from the stalls. It's like, oh, there is only zucchini and tomatoes this week. Yeah. (laughs) But that's what you get. And then the next week it could be completely like the diversity of uh, fruit and veggies is again like uh, beautiful. And so it really allows as well for you know, living a little bit more in sync with what it's on season and what it's available and not just because you, uh, and by the way, as you know, when mango season is on, 
there is plenty of mangoes here too and avocados. Can't go past a good mango. <laughs> I know. And avocados are incredible. They're such an amazing species. I mean, growing a fat yeah. on a tree like that. It's amazing. They're one of those species where you, you can never tell beforehand, I guess, how far you can push a particular species outside of its home environment. Some have greater tolerance than others. Avocado, for a subtropical Amazonian mid-canopy species, it's remarkable how far it's thriving outside of its home range. Like in Pemberton, southwestern Australia, yeah. you'd never suspect that that would be a big commercial region for growing avocados. That's right. I know in uh, South Australia, there is a saying, like uh, further down close to the Fleur Peninsula, mm -hmm. which is like, again, it's like, a, what is an avocado farm doing there? And yet right. they're doing really well. Mm. So yeah, pretty amazing. I listened to your audiobook. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what is it now? It's 10.38. We started talking at 10.30. I finished listening to it at 10.25. <laughs> so it's very fresh in my mind. Oh, good. So you might know what's in there because I don't know. You can't remember? I'll remind <laughs> I, you. I, I don't remember. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, I'll remind you. You were growing up in northern Italy. Mm -hmm. If your book is any indication, you've done a fair bit of looking around the planet. In the meantime, that's right. Was there any indication when you were growing up that you had an affinity to the natural world? Were you an elemental kid? Um, I think I was, but I, uh, as often is the case, either you are given the opportunities and you you thrive in that, or you are completely deprived from opportunity, and so you desperately go looking for it later. Mm -hmm. And so when I was uh, little, I lived in an apartment uh, in a city, uh, and, you know, I mentioned this before, like for my parents, nature is not a place where you go spending time with. Mm. It's a place where you just, uh, you know, pass through, or it's useful because, you know, it might provide you with something, but... We didn't really spend time in nature. We didn't go camping or any of that kind of stuff. And the closest to nature for me was uh, well, some of my pet animals, which even now if I think about it, oh, my God, that's, that's uh, like nature entrapped. And yet that was I, what I had. Right. Or uh, another um, paradox, like the, the park, yeah. the manicured park where I was playing when I was a child. And But I think... You know, I always had that, obviously, inside. So I remember when I was little, um, funny enough, uh, rescuing pigeons from car crashes. Right. <laughs> and so I made, you know, I collected a few pigeons here and there and put them in a, you know, shoe box with, like, nice towels and everything. And my grandma was a nurse. So she would help me make a little, you know, let's fix the leg or mm -hmm. let's fix the wing. And so there was... Um, my way I guess to connect and look after and and also I just couldn't yeah I I was finding it difficult to understand how other people especially the adults in my life uh, except for my grandma I guess but how they wouldn't really care about the fact that there were so many you know animals and trees and these I'm talking about a city so compared yeah. to like real nature it would be nothing but yeah for me it was um through uh, starvation, I guess, that I had to then uh, go and find it for myself. Okay, interesting. What was your undergrad at uni? Was that in Italy? No, no. I left Italy when I finished high school and I went to study uh, marine science, marine biology in the UK. Right. And, uh, and the only reason why I ended up in the UK was because uh, I actually, uh, a few years earlier, when I was still what we call the middle school, so I would have been around maybe 10 or 12, Yep. I uh, I always knew I wanted to work with the ocean. Mm -hmm. And of course, I wasn't living near the ocean at all. I was up in the mountains. So, And uh, and I contacted this man from the US uh, in my own way of writing in English, which who knows how he understood anything. But yeah. And basically, I was saying, I just want to work with the... I love the animals. I, I love the ocean. I want to work with that. And I don't know, what, would, what do I do? Mm -hmm. uh, I want to come and study and work with you. And uh, of course, uh, like uh, in most cases, I think people would not even reply. But this man actually did. And he was like, 
well, you know, maybe you can look a bit closer. How about the UK? And maybe you can finish school first. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that really changed uh, something for me because it's one of those moments in my life and I think in many people's life when you receive the encouragement from someone uh, at the right time that is like, oh, so I can actually do this. Yeah. So when I finished high school, I just uh, applied and got a scholarship to go to the UK and do marine biology exactly as I wanted. So that's where I did my training. There's a lot to that that encouragement to children, just letting them know that this mm. this is a possibility. It's, it's very simple, but it can, it can open up a whole window exactly. where uh, there wasn't a window perceived before. Like I actually, um, exactly. I grew up down the road from the University of Western Australia mm. and know that area extremely well. And I'm often actually still to this day, I take walks through the uh, botany area. I've just uh, be been accepted to go back to uni and do archaeology at UWA. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. And because I didn't realise it was a possibility when I was a little kid, like what I would have loved to have done it. I remember wanting to be Indiana Jones or a paleontologist, <laughs> like that. but I just didn't. Of I, course. Yeah. I, who doesn't? <laughs> but um just didn't think it was possible. It wasn't reflected back to me in my surroundings, so it just mm -hmm. wasn't a perceived option. But by the time you started studying, formally studying ecology, biology in one form or another, you had left Italy. Oh, yeah. You've spent a lot of time in Australia living and working and you've had adventures here or there around the world. Since the further development of your conscious relationship with ecology have you gone back to reassess readdress re-explore your relationship in particular to european botany and ethnobotany and the landscape it's an interesting question because actually uh, a few years ago so i should first say that i did part of my master in south africa jesus you've been everywhere <laughs> <laughs> and it was amazing. And South Africa actually was really important for me because uh, it was the first time I was coming out of the European environment. Right. And it was the first time that I realized that I had an experience of how European I was in my way, my thinking, in my expectation of how things should be. Mm -hmm. And um, I had an amazing time in South Africa. I met beautiful people, but... The thing that really, really did it for me was actually the landscape right. because I was in Cape Town and uh, I was, uh, the master was uh, um, UCT, the University of Cape Town, and it sits right at the base of the Big Table Mountain. Right. So every time you go, every morning I had to walk to my office and I had to look up at this enormous mountain, just beautiful. And, and it was the first time that I really felt like, oh my God, this is what I've been missing all along. This is what I was searching all along. And I've been searching home mm. since I was a child. Mm. And that's why I left Italy because it never really felt like home to me. Right. And in South Africa was the first time that I had a sense of what home for me was. And home was that connection. Mm. And that big mountain gave me that feeling. And I was like, oh my God, this is it. And I remember like uh, many times in the morning, like, uh, crying you know walking up the road just feeling like uh, I can't believe I didn't I didn't know that this was home mm. and uh, so South Africa was very important and then of course I, I've been traveling a lot moved to Australia and and feel very at home in Australia just uh, this land feels beautiful to me mm -hmm. and yeah so rich in so many ways but at one time during the last few years, when I went back to Italy uh, to visit my family, I was, uh, you know, I landed in Turin Airport, and then there is a train ride of about maybe 45 minutes that mm -hmm. goes towards the mountains. And so, so you're sitting in the train and you're looking outside the window. And I always love train trips for that because you're looking outside and someone is taking you, you know, and you can just stare and. Yeah. Oh, I'm the, I'm the same. I love train rides here yeah, through the countryside. Trains are beautiful for that. That's right. So, and because this train goes straight for the mountains mm -hmm. and uh, because where I come from is right at the base of it. Um, I remember looking up the mountains and of course I grew up there. So I, but I, I realized in that moment that I never really saw the mountains. Right. And in, on that train that day, it was the first time that I saw those mountains, how beautiful they were and, and it felt really, an, again, a potent moment for me as the human being because 
I realized that, wow, I ran away from this place all the time because I never felt at home. And now I can see how this is also my home. You know, everywhere is my home, but this is also my home. And I remember thinking, I, as I was on this train, I remember having this little image coming up in my, in my head and it was of a little dandelion. Yeah. And, um, and what I felt, it was like, you see, you uh, have grown in a place that at the time you could only see the concrete that was covering the land. Yeah. Uh, but you see, yeah, like this dandelion, because dandelions are really good at cracking through concrete and growing everywhere, right? Indeed. And, um, and he, the feeling was that you see the dandelion cracks through concrete and you, what you see is the flower on the top and the leaves, but the roots, the roots are way deep. Mm -hmm. And your roots, if you're that dandelion, your roots uh, way deep into those mountains. Yeah. So I had this feeling of like, wow, the mountains are not just what I see as the big peaks of the Alps, and but they are the, the entire land is the mountains. And I I was made literally the material, the matters that fed me and made me was these mountains. Mm. So um, so yeah, it was again a really important moment because. Um, it was the first time I actually appreciated the place where I was born. Um, that's really interesting because as an Australian, a European Australian, and I've mentioned this before different times, the lack of explicit open collective discussion about the European Australian identity and genesis and history um, was deafening. And I, I now in mm -hmm. retrospect realise that I had a very strong sense of the absence of something important occurring when I was a kid. And it's taken me years and years and years to refine a language and an understanding of myself and the world to realize that it was this, it was this like cultural chasm of this lack of story being told, but also the fact that for different reasons, European Australia has never had to form what you might call a sustainable deep folk relationship with the land because we've mm -hmm. always had different means of propping up the culture injections of welfare from mother england or extractive industries where we don't have to produce anything we just rip things out of the ground or cut them down and sell them off so mm. we've never been faced with the ecological realities of the continent here mm. you know, that's a real issue and it's a not just a, not just an issue because it poses a potential threat to our physical survival in the event of a crisis energy crisis it's also like a constant crazy making buzzing in the background of our minds and so like when I went to Europe for the first time and I wasn't, I, you know, I was 19 and that's what Australians do. We all piss off overseas. <laughs> so, and I was never like daydreaming of Europe or dying to visit here or dying to visit there. I was a kid, but I remember going there and this strange sense of genetic, like, oh, like, yeah. I think it had something to do with the tone of green being different you know how different the australian green is to the european green mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> how would you express your relationship between the different character of the european landscape and botany and the australian landscape if that's not too vague no no no, no. it makes total sense and actually it's interesting because for me uh, especially when i travel including when i go to italy i uh, identify myself as an australian right and I present my Australian passport when I enter Italy. You feel generally more Australian now? Well, yeah, but it's the land. Right. I feel, I'm not a nationalist, so I don't care about the flag. It's more like literally, I feel like, ah, oh, this is exactly that sense of like, ah, finally, I now feel grounded. Right. Like my feet do recognize this feeling, even if, of course, I wasn't born here, but there is obviously a more ancient part of mm -hmm. all of us that knows exactly which part of this planet resonates best with yeah, or something. Yeah. I don't know. Or maybe that I was simply meant to come here. Yeah. And uh, so, um, and I guess for me, primarily is the fact that uh, Europe is completely covered in concrete. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much you have like little pockets of national parks here and there, but actually a lot of Europe is uh, populated, heavily populated and covered in concrete. And, 
what I was missing, I think, was this uh, space for breeding, which Australia uh, does have. And, you know, it doesn't take us very long. You drive just uh, half an hour, really, and you're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And you can't stay if you want, if you choose to. You can stay in a place that you will see no person for a while. Yeah. And I really love that. And um, in Italy or in Europe in general, it's really quite hard to find those spots. And you have to make an effort. And... And so I think for me, um, the, the feeling of the land, it's how grounded it makes me feel. And so in Italy, I always feel, I've always felt, and I still feel that I, um, I'm only a visitor. I'm actually going visiting. And now when I do, it feels like, yeah, this is exactly what I, what I do. I don't belong here. I just right. come and visit. And it gives a sense to the way in which I've always felt when I was younger. While when I'm in Australia, uh, and you know, it's not that all oh, my, my Australian life is so romantically perfect. It's like, of course, it's just life full of rubbish and full of beauty and all of that. Yeah. But uh, there is always this sense that, especially when things maybe are a bit difficult, there is always this sense that I can just go for a walk up the road in the national park or, you know, at the waterfall or wherever. Mm. And I used to, when I was at UWI, I used to go to the river mm. from my office on the, on campus. I just used to cross the road, be at the river, and already feeling just better, just feeling like, ah, okay. And this feeling is, I think, what really colors the experience of where you are, for me, at least it does. And Yeah, space and stability are two things that Australia offers a sense of and an actual experience of stability, whether mm -hmm. geological and tectonic. There really is a sense of Australia having been laying there, doing what it's been doing for a prodigious time period, and it, it's not in a hurry to shift. And relative uh, cultural and economic stability and the space, absolutely. And, mm -hmm. you know, European and, and Indigenous Australia have a troubled relationship and there's a whole lot of skeletons in the closet that must and will be aired and dealt with. And we're seeing that dialogue starting now. Yeah. But there was a bloke, I can't remember where he was from. I think he was South American as well. But anyway, he said how much he perceives European Australia as having been influenced by Indigenous Australia. We said, well, just like the way European Australians are, like we're, we, we can be thoroughly urbane people living in suburbs and cities, but we still have this sense of that one's relationship to nature is completely natural. The barefoot Australian to me now is this is almost a perfect symbol of that mm -hmm. of coarseness to, to one's proximity to nature, mm -hmm. not always reverence of, not always like, conscious meaningful connection and doing the right thing but it's, i'm reminded of when my friends and i went to europe we were in antibes in the south of france walking around barefoot just the looks we were getting oh dear oh, like and people were actually throwing tomatoes at us from buildings like <laughs> we got we got escorted out of monte carlo for being shirtless and shoeless <laughs> well i can share a story that is very similar i went back to italy once and um Actually, it was, which I think in a way is also similar. I had spent a while, a while in South Africa, and after that, I went to New Zealand for a while. And so I had been almost away for a year with no shoes right. in those two places. And then I went to Italy. <laughs> and, of course, I just, like, uh, shoes actually are overrated. And Italy, of all places, you know, like, uh, shoes are, like, uh, maybe more important than the Pope. So uh, you do not, you don't know, you don't mess around with shoes. Yeah. So uh, the idea that I'm going in the middle of town with no shoes, it was a big deal. And I know from my sister that actually my mom was uh, really upset because uh, she was concerned about what people would say. And I know that people would have been said things. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, but, uh, and I just, um, yeah, this feeling of the of the foot on the ground, really, I learned that from these places. And, of course, Australia, like, uh, I wear shoes randomly, basically, when I really have to and if it's appropriate, you know, because I'm also respectful of the spaces that other people right. uh, enter into. But, um, but, yeah, I live in a house that is made, half of the house is made of uh, rocks and stone. Ah. So... 
like this the the stone that was the rock that was on the land is being used to build this uh, part of the house. So you know, I'm on the ground all the time, and I'm, I'm barefoot on my in my house, obviously all the time. So yeah, this uh, connecting the literally with the ground, I think it's um, it's very important, and and in a way, it's really funny because um, you know those who have a problem with that, especially in country like Europe, but it makes total sense because to find the actual ground, to actually put your feet on the ground that is not concrete. It's uh, you have to go and look for it. While you can find, you know, the ground here pretty easily. So, or the ground will find you actually. So, uh, I think it's. Um, I, I I never thought of that, but it makes sense that the indigeneity of the land itself, you know, the the yeah. feeling of the land itself would uh, trickle and make us who we are. Right. And regardless of whether we like it or not, regardless of whether we acknowledge that or not. And, um, yeah, which also, in a way, highlights even more our not talking about these uh, skeletons in the closets from the past in our interactions as, you know, the European interacting with the, with Indigenous people that were here already, um, it makes no sense because actually the same land is feeding exactly. us. And so in a way, if anything, we are becoming more and more like each other than anything else. And, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way of the different cultures, but um, so the land is, um, yeah, the land is for me what really makes us. Yes, like, and I did think that when when this guy said that we were... European Australians were more influenced by Indigenous Australians than we realised. I, I thought, well, is that the case, mm. or is it just the fact that we are we are li- living upon and resonating with the same energies, and they're going to express it in that way? That's right. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, so to move along to a slightly different thread, one of the main takeaways from your book, apart from the story of your your journey and the revelations or very very strong suggestions regarding and implications on on plant consciousness and similar is re-exploration and a blurring of lines and boundaries between the subjective and the objective mm-hmm. uh, to me i i've often find, found it absolutely gobsmacking from a young age that we revere the purely objectifiable measurable phenomena in a quote unquote external reality, you know, maths is king, physics mm-hmm. is something just short of, and then chemistry and then biology, and then everything else is almost just eye rolling hippy dippy shit, including like psychology mm-hmm. and all the rest, according to the, mm-hmm. the gatekeepers of academia. But in the meantime, we are encouraged to dispose of our very subjective experience as at best a secondary tier of phenomena. Mm-hmm. That's, I've got, there's no other way to say it. That's fucking insane. It is totally madness. To take one's very own experience of reality and then delegate that way, way into the background as a secondary or tertiary consideration, it's fucking crazy. And it's totally indicative of this mm-hmm. schizophrenia that we are embodying as a, I won't say species necessarily, but culture, industrialised culture at large. I have great appreciation for the scientific method and its efficacy is obvious in what it has allowed us to do. However, we've placed way too much faith in it as some overarching grand epistemology. Religion. Well, that's what's occurred now. Like, can can you speak to your perspective on the difference between what's been called scientism, which is this cult, church, religion of science, versus the actual pure form of the scientific method? Jesus, that took me a while to get out of my mouth. <laughs> because it's uh, it's actually simple, but we, they, in a way, I like to exactly. It's actually a very simple thing that we made very complex, and we keep complicating it more and more just because that seems to be a good way to do things. Um, okay, so the scientific method is one thing. The practice of science and now in the culture of science is a very different thing. Mm. So the method is just a tool 
And like any other tool, you can deploy it when it's appropriate. And also, it might not be the right tool to apply, to apply in every circumstance. Mm -hmm. But when the culture of science becomes this um, gover governing culture, mm -hmm. because I don't want to say dominating, because uh, I think that it's a bit too strong, maybe, but governing. So it's giving directive. It's close. Yeah, it's giving directive of how you're supposed to experience the world. And if you don't experience, if you if your experience falls outside those directives, then uh, you're not doing it right. Right. But that's the irony. It's like uh, because the scientific method is never it was never designed. It's not designed to test right or wrong or whether my experience is correct or not. It's just a tool to explore the experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in itself, it doesn't speak of subjectivity or objectivity. So it's the cultural science that then has made it like, it has to be in a particular way to be right. And I guess my own experience with uh, science has been that I had to be fully, fully um, in, trained into this culture to then appreciate the things that are not so good about it or they're not really uh, useful for science itself. So, for example, the, the aspect of subjectivity in science is like, well, you talk to any scientist and in the privacy of their own closet, they will totally acknowledge that without the subjectivity, there are, which creativity is part of, mm. there would be no science. Mm. So how do you come up with even like, how do you think of numbers talking about maths? Right. How do you think of numbers or how do you think of things that don't even exist? How do you think of abstraction mm. if you're not using your creative self, which is your subjective self? Mm -hmm. There's nothing objective about maths. Um, but then it is portrayed by a certain culture as the math, the math is the objectification of science. Mm. And it's like, uh, I, I don't think so. But, you know, in my experience, uh, what I started doing, um, and I am working actually with anthropologists and philosophers and artists to trying to find the right language, because language is another problem mm. with this. It's like uh, the language has been... Um, construed in a way that it doesn't even allow you to, to speak of uh, this subjectivity in a way that it doesn't sound, uh, yeah, new agey or whatever. So it's a very strange territory to navigate. We're re-exploring it as this particular culture. I mean, there are still living traditional human systems of subjective interpretation and expression that are still totally alive. Totally. When I teach permaculture, for instance, when I teach the plant section, I always go through the energetic and uh, That's right. the more herbalist energetic approach to plant-human interaction and relationship. People are amazed to discover that like, I use astrological terms to describe mm -hmm. human relationships and subjective experiences. Forget whether what planet in the sky at what time is doing what to what, put that aside for the moment. That language to explain yep. through a symbolic form and a whole chart of, of correspondences, the subjective experience of being a being. They do exist, yeah. but you're, you're correct. People turn their noses up at that. I think. I guess we've just been trained to think and feel that anything sounding like that is disposable, hippie shit. Not as not acceptable. Actually, it's not acceptable. It's like you can do it over there in the privacy of your garden if you really want to, but don't bring it here. Right. But that's the yeah, thing. It's almost taboo. But it is totally a taboo, and that's why the work that I'm doing with this, uh, especially with some of the anthropologists, is exactly about that. It's like okay, so. Until this kind of conversation remains in the privacy of little gardens and permaculture circles and biodynamics farmers and all of that, it will remain as this fringe that is like, yeah, but the real thing is over here and science has the word on this. Mm. But what if uh, we bring this right in the center of science? Right. <laughs> so, and so what we've been doing is like, uh, uh, we are in the process, for example, at the moment to write a paper uh, on the making of an experiment. Mm -hmm. And an experiment that apparently looks like it's failing. Right. And in that context is like, so there is a clear question with the experiment. And in this specific case was about decision-making and choice in pea plants. 
And uh, I set up my experiment according to the rules that I know and uh, following all, respecting all the rules of a proper scientific approach. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the experiment seems to fail. And the way in which uh, we are judging even what fails and what doesn't is based on expectation or what it should be. And so in this case, the choice that the peas are making is not the choice that I'm expecting them to make. But it's not just that. They are making a different choice. Mm. So it's not that they are all going randomly and so the experiment simply is not doing anything. But no, no, they are all uh, agreeing of making a very specific choice, simply not the one that I thought they should be making, given the setup. Yeah. So there is a choice being made by the plants and it's just I don't understand what this choice is. Right. So the only way forward for me in this case was to actually acknowledge that there is another in this experiment, that I am part of the experiment, not this detached outsider, but I am part of the experiment. Mm -hmm. The plants themselves are not just objects that I can test, but they are, they are making the experiment with me. And in their behavior, they're telling me, yeah, yeah, we know what you're saying here, but actually we are choosing this way. Right. And it's up to you to work out what this way actually means. Mm -hmm. And what happened in the course of the evolution of this study was that, you know, we actually described in the paper exactly all the feelings that arise when this, something like this happened. And so the idea of like failure, first of all, because there is an expectation that you need to fit in a particular boundary. Mm -hmm. And then the failure transforms into like, uh, or maybe I'm just not good enough. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. And there is always this, you know, this uh, self um, rejection. Yeah, they, exactly. There is a rejection because there is already on the plate in the system, there is already another bit of information that I have acknowledged because I can see it. But I, if I acknowledge that, I need to acknowledge that I need to take a different route to my experiment. Mm. And so then it transforms again into okay, so let's say that I acknowledge that plants in this experiment are collaborating with me in co-creating the answer. Mm -hmm. What would it look like if that was the attitude? And so what happened is that we moved this, the entire setup outside. It was inside a lab. We moved it outside. And then the entire setup changed again because the plants were, you know, kind of, in a way, kind of asking for it to be modified. And now it is working, but even the question has changed. Mm -hmm. And now it's almost like uh, I'm just uh, running the experimental component of something that will speak to the, the particular human mind that I'm trying to speak to, which is within the scientific uh, and the arena. But, uh, but the, how we got there, how we get there is very different. And in this case, the plants are the co-author of the work. Right. And I am part of the experiment. I'm not outside. And the experiment itself is not just the question, but it's all of the materials, literally, the, the soil, the land, uh, in what direction I put the plants, because I think that one of my problems with the initial study was that there was something in the land, in the space where the experiment was done, that was telling the plants something that I don't even know what it is. Right. And it was basically like they didn't like that direction. And so yeah. nobody would ever go there. And if I put my treatment there, they would not go. Yeah. And um, what did it know? But the, the answer was like, they were talking to me very clearly. It's like, we don't like that. Whatever that is, we don't like it. And it brings up another aspect of science that is underestimated and the idea or the power of the not knowing. Mm. You know, there is this idea that science is the, uh, you know, omni, omni essent, you know, it knows everything and it's about finding answers. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes science doesn't find any answer. It's just an exploration. And in the, it's the process of exploring that gives us multiple answers, not a final goal. Well, that's a creative impulse it, rather than like the head hunting, trophy hunting impulse. Exactly. And so it changes completely the approach. This is still, you know, the study is being done and conducted exactly according to the scientific method, mm. but is uh, trying, I guess, to do it under a different cultural premise. Still scientific, but different. The Octarian tree will return after these important messages. To my mind, in the Invisible College, when Valet says, in looking at the effect, not asking the question, what is it, 
but what does it do? You very quickly see what they are doing. What they are doing is eroding faith in science. They are an antidote to the scientific paradigm that has evolved over the past 400 years and which has led us to the brink of global catastrophe. <laughs> Within the structure of the human psyche, there is phenomena can be induced not by the egos of men and women, not by their institutions, but by the overmind, the, the collectivity of the human species, phenomena can be induced which are so corrosive to the ideologies currently in place that their underpinnings are cut away, their validity is called into question, and their programs for social development and control are invalidated and destroyed. Rationalism scientific technology which began and came out of uh, the scholasticism of the Middle Ages and the quite legitimate wish to glorify God through an appreciation of his natural world turned into a kind of demonic pact, a kind of descent into the underworld, a nekeia, if you will, leading to the present cultural and political impasse that involves massive stockpiles of atomic weapons, huge propagandized populations cut off from any knowledge of their real histories, uh, male-dominated organizations plying their message of uh, lethal destruction and inevitable historical advance. And into this situation comes suddenly an anomaly something which cannot be explained. I believe that that is the purpose, to inject uncertainty into the male-dominated, paternalistic, rational, solar myth under which we are suffering. <clears throat> so an assertion of herself by the goddess into history, saying to science and paternalistically uh, governed and driven organizations, you have gone far enough. We are going to turn the world upside down. Your science is going to be shown up for what it is, nothing more than a pleasant metaphor usefully extrapolated into the production of toys for healthy children. That's what science is good for. It is not some meta-theory at whose feet every point of view from astrology to acupressure to channeling need be laid to have the hand of science announce thumbs up or thumbs down. This will be a fascinating thing to watch over the next generation or two as the rigidity of uh, scientism, the religion of science, mm -hmm. slowly starts, you know, its grip is slowly starting to be loosened. People's minds are opening up to the fact that it's a tool and perhaps it's a very, very important part of a greater toolkit. Yep. And we have other parts of that toolkit that already exist within different living or even quote unquote extinct in search of a better term, human cultures. And there are others that we have even yet to discover. There are things that we haven't gleaned yet or with, you know, at least within living memory mm -hmm. and watching this greater epistemological with, I don't know whether it would be a system, whether or not it's codified rigidly like the scientific method, but just watching these new ways of deducing truth emerge is going to be fascinating because it's, and it's not just because it will give us a capacity to manufacture ever more cool, lucrative toys, but <laughs> it's because the human worldview science as the dominator or the materialism as well scientific mm -hmm. materialism as the governor or dominator it disposes of the subjective it disposes of the human experience like you talk in your book linear time now i think linear time is close to being the hub of the issue close to 
I don't know if it is mm-hmm. it. I'm still foggy. But this idea that everything else is just disregarded. We have this centralized imperial regime, like this net that is cast out from Greenwich and captures mm-hmm. the planet. And it's the only important thing. And everything else is disposable. You don't matter. Your internal rhythms don't matter. All that matters is the efficiency of imperial time. It, and that trickles down into every aspect of our of our experience, I think. And we're dealing with, I, I think we are dealing with collectively like this sense of perceived death of spirit. Yeah. It kills our sense of and connection to spirit. Mm-hmm. This thing we call the human condition, this state that we're in and that many people are asking questions about, this schizo worldview, what's its root cause? That's a big question, <laughs> right? Yeah. Do you have a sense of like <laughs> at its root, what are we dealing with? Well, there are lots of things in this in this uh, question. Uh, one, I guess, the important thing, and of course, what I'm going to share is um, my experience. It might not be true for everyone, and that is also part of the thing that there is no one way because otherwise we're just going to do the same as we already done. There's like, oh, if it's not science, it's something else, but it's always right. there's one perspective that dominates everything. Yes, great. So this is just one perspective amongst many possibilities is mine and it doesn't have to be correct for everyone or for anyone. It's for me. Sure. But um, so first I find it really uh, kind of funny that uh, a society that is so materialistic like ours uh, actually cares so little for matter. So as you said, it's like we discard it, we don't care. We don't even care about our bodies, right. really, because if we cared, we wouldn't uh, drive them to the ground as we do. And then, so it, that in itself is already a sign that even what we say we subscribe for, like materialism, mm. is actually, we don't even understand what that is, because uh, otherwise, um, where is our love for matter would you say it shows more a general disregard for every anything? There's a lack of meaning. And disconnect. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. We call it materialism, but we don't even that matter, actually. We give so very little value to matter. Right. Uh, that's a good point. That, then what does it do? And then the other thing connected to this is like that, for me, I think that to in response or trying to address your question of the human condition is like, well, matter is the matter of the question, of the, of the topic, because we are in physical bodies. And uh, um, it's almost like, um, again, for me, it feels like uh, I am a spirit that transcends time and space all the time. Mm-hmm. And um, every so often I win the lottery and I get a physical body made of matter, Mm -hmm. which is my experience for one every so often time of like, Oh, let's see what it looks like if I do this. And in this reality, particularly, which is a material reality, I need to have a material something to be able to interface and interact. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's why then when, when my little uh, story is done, I'll just uh, give back the materials (laughs) that get recycled for making someone else's body doesn't have to be human and it's all done and I'm just going to be back to spirit. So the dying is actually when we don't understand that. I think for me, the dying is uh, when we are living and we don't appreciate that uh, we are not caring for the material. So the, the materials that makes us as the human beings that we are, not the spirit, because the spirit is almost like you're there always. But the material and, and having the opportunity to be given this material so that you can come in this form once every in a while, that is the really cool, wicked thing. That's the special, like, you won the lottery. Mm. Off you go and enjoy the ride. And, uh, and that, of course, then stretches because if you don't care about the matter, then you don't care about the, the, all of the matter. You don't appreciate that the matter, so we go back to the land and the ground, that same matter is the matter that makes you. But why don't we care? Because I, I think a misunderstanding, we don't understand who we are. And so then we ask the question of like, oh, what is the human condition? And if I say, well, the human condition is uh, a spirit into a material form, uh, that sounds very new agey and hippie and spiritual, but it doesn't really connect. And so I think that in a way, that's probably why a lot of indigenous um, 
and again, I speak for myself, my, in my experience, the people uh, that I have interacted in an indigenous contest are often very, very grounded people. Right. <laughs> there is no fluff. There is no like, they are really like, they are here, mm. fully here. And I think what I learned is like, uh, yeah, that's right. If you're looking for yourself, be fully present here, grounded, which means really embody the spirit and the body that you are. And uh, which, of course, it doesn't mean like uh, be obsessed, <laughs> which is what right. we do. We obsess just with the physical body or at the same time, be obsessed just with the spiritual because we see these a lot in, you know, new agey or... As separate. Yeah, exactly. Spiritual circle are as bad as the full-on materialist on the other stream where, you know, it's all about the spirit. It's all about how many hours of meditation I'm going to do. And it's all about that. <clears throat> and then I can be unkind with people around me because uh, they're different than me anyway. And, you know, I don't care. Uh, what was it? Robert Antold Wilson called it being a cosmic schmuck. That's right. <laughs> I strongly, I do strongly suspect these marching orders we've been given to pay attention to linear time exclusively. I strongly suspect that has a lot to do with us being pulled out of the present. That's right. Not just the concept of linear time, which is at very best, it's an impartial expression of, of how time works. But at worst, it is the very thing that keeps us on us to, and on our toes in this anxious state, past, future, keeping up yeah. with. There's this constant niggling the wolves at the door sense of not enoughness and race, got to race, got to run. Oh, I would love to just relax today. Nope, you can't. You've got to do what you've got to do. Like imprisons us. Uh, there is actually, in that, there is actually another small comment because I guess it's again another contradiction and our system seems to be full of that because uh, so this linear time that pushes us from behind and go forward and go faster mm. who knows why but you know so we are always feeling in a hurry and yet if we do and actually subscribe to linear time it just means that we're going from birth to death in a really fast mm. hurry and yet we are also scared of dying mm. so we are constantly rushing towards death Again, because we don't understand, I think, what death really is. But mm. And we are in constant fear of that moment. And yet, uh, every day, we have an opportunity to just slow down and just like enjoy the ride, and we don't. Contradiction. Pink Floyd lyrics is, is it the song Time, actually, funnily enough? Is it Time? Um, off Dark Side <laughs> of the Moon, where they sing... Hanging on in quiet desperation is the English way. <laughs> Industrialised culture, just, there's this sense of... People have just gotten used to a panic. That's right. Our anxiety in, in this culture either expresses itself overtly close to the surface of one's mind and visible expression, and then we, we're told we have an anxiety disorder and or, <laughs> and I'm talking about the majority of people, not everyone, I still perceive it being there, but it's pushed right down and they just get on with it and there is a deadening, you know, because the, there's this, this yeah. calcified emotional energetic kind of husk around that panic we're panicky we're petrified of death yeah we are petrified of this whip behind us being cracked hurry up hurry up we have a sense of like a fear of regret oh i'm wasting time i'm just killing time we are aware of these things in the back of the mind yes and it's in one big pretzel knot and uh we we don't know what to do with it <laughs> we currently we, we don't have the tools currently that's right. And yet I find that when we, like when you go, and I return to the land, when you go out in, in country, that's exactly what you do. You, you're forced to slow down. If you're really connected with country, you're forced to slow down. And just like, again, as, at least this is my experience, you have this sense of like, oh, I could be here forever and also for a second, and I don't really know what the difference is. Mm. And that's where time breaks down, the, the linear concept of time breaks down, and you have this feeling of like, oh, actually, there is a sense of infinite, infinite time yes. and infinite space. And it's much softer, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think um, maybe I'm hoping, I, I guess this is my hope, that... Um, Maybe this is why a lot of the indigenous voices are really rising now because that's how they live. That's how that's been their experience. 
And I don't want to put words into their mouth, but, you know, in my understanding, that it's a, a very indigenous experience. And then, and then they are confronted with, uh, with the madness. And they're trying to say, like, guys, stop, you're, you're mad. You're, you're going off road. It's like, just come and sit here and let me tell your story. Mm. And, uh, oh, but I don't have time for that. But the moment you do make the time, then you realize, wow, actually, this is, was exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. And... Uh, and I think that can be very transformative. And I think I'm hoping that the rise of all of these voices around the world uh, is hopefully going to allow people to connect with that part of them that is like, oh, I forgot about this, actually. Yeah. You know, I don't need to. I don't need to rush around. I don't need to be crazy. I don't need to even be um, angry at what's happening. Because if you think about it, especially here in Australia, the what happened here if it was the story was in reverse oh my god we will never ever end our retaliation and instead we are you know engaged with people who are still despite the horror reminding us that actually you know we need to work together for this and then sometimes I think given that, you know, Australia is primarily, like the white Australia is primarily made up of Europeans. <laughs> um, you know, the history of Europe, we forgot our own history Indeed. too. Because the history of Europe, if you go back in time, is exactly the same that we did when we arrived here. It's like uh, we were both the persecutors and the victims of a time, you know, we all experienced our children be, being taken, our women being killed. We, in, in you know in the history of our yeah. uh, European background, all of that those experiences are there. Europe has been through so many wars, so much violence, and so then what we did, we exported what we had: Absolutely. violence and war, and we repeated exactly what we experienced onto others. I mean, we are all indigenous at heart. The poison is the medicine. That's right. Where else can you be? <laughs> the usurped becomes the usurper. That's right. And that's an extremely that you know what that's a really interesting thread the the healing of the European trauma because that's what was exported mm -hmm. around the world. Basically formed industrialized culture. Was it Rome? Can you take it back to Rome? Because mm -hmm. there was there, you know there's I I look at these kind of periods of trauma and severing of connection to country and spirit and self mm -hmm. and other community you know these trauma events and there are a number of them you can point to but the western european was rome did a serious number at least the western european and north african and indigenous cultures at the time and also northern europe all over yeah. rome went and you know they were they were not very pretty with the Northern Europeans either. You know Mark Jones? Yes. He and I have been having some really interesting discussions about this and the events that have actually caused these traumas. Like him, I have a very strong suspicion that we have a collective trauma mm. due to some form of cataclysm that occurred mm -hmm. sometime around the Pleistocene-Holocene divide. Because to me, it looks like mm -hmm. what happens when there is a crisis when a crisis occurs, the archetype or the human expression that comes out is what I call military dad. <laughs> when your norm has been so interrupted so dramatically and your physical survival is at such peril, that survival instinct, which is necessary and appropriate and as sacred as any other archetype or mm -hmm. aspect of ourselves, comes out in order to best ensure physical survival. To me, it looks like that didn't get turned off. That's right. It's like yeah, in, in the industrialized mind and heart, it's this military dad who is still, you know, hurry, hurry up, pull your socks up, march, march. No, your feelings just don't matter. We have to eat. We have to, you know, we have to think, plan this out and plot. We don't have time to breathe and relax. Your feeling, your subjective experience doesn't matter. Move. If you're too slow, you're going to get eaten. Yeah. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling now. But, no, um, but it actually reminds me of something else which connects as well as uh, with my work with plants. And, uh, and it is, again, about time. And this time, it's about time scales. Right. Because, you know, like, uh, well, even our European history from the Romans to now is like, so what? 2,000 years. Mm. And 
compared to 60,000. Right. Like, so this military dad might be on, it might be very bossy and very destructive. Mm. But actually, we have spent, as humanity, we have spent much more time in a different space that it wasn't this. So I, I think that we must have had other times where military dad, I like this, military dad came up mm. and then he go like, yeah, okay, you've done your job now, move on. You move on. Right. And uh, so hopefully in the wider, longer time scale, this is just one of those moments where military dad is going to be like, okay, now you move on. You've done your job. I agree. It's like a relative blip given the vastness of geological or cosmic time. Um, but that, that's very little consolation to the actual human experience of the people living it. <laughs> I just pray that we can find a way. It's time now, surely, yep. to find the switch or to be able to allow ourselves to relax into reality. Yeah. That's right. Come back home, come back here. <laughs> yeah. I think I've probably kept you long enough. and I think I've done more than half the talking today. <laughs> that's all right. It was good. <laughs> No, no, it's great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just thinking uh, as a thought, uh, you know, we are flooding here. Last year we had fires and floods, um, the COVID situation and all of that. I think that there is um, a way, in which, again, because uh, it would be very arrogant for us to think that we are the only one in charge here, like me in my lab, you know, it's me doing the experiment. Mm. And then to discover, actually, no, you're just part of the experiment, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that if this is an experiment where we are part of the experiment, which also means that there are others, and in this case, the planet itself, mm -hmm. uh, who have, have something to say. And, uh, you know, floods and fires and famines and COVIDs and diseases are a pretty good weapon against... Um, all of this destruction and destruction of the mind. Mm -hmm. So I think that what I've observed, and I receive a lot of emails from people from everywhere, just, um, you know, thank you for your work. And I've been gardening now. And, and I think that a lot of people in this, uh, maybe that's what we needed. To, we needed to be constrained and squished so hard mm to find like, a, oh God, I can't breathe. The only thing I can think of doing is I'm going to plant a veggie patch. Yeah. Or I'm going to plant, I'm going to put some plants in a pot, even if it's on the windowsill. Yeah. But this basic need for connection with what really matters, life, I think we are all experiencing that in different forms. And so I have, I don't have faith in anything in particular, but I trust life very much so. Mm. And I um, I would like to, I, I want to trust that all that is happening is exactly perfect as it is with all the tragedy and all the pain because it's already moving us in a different space. In one year, I think that more people than ever have actually reconnected with the plants than they have a dreamt of doing before. Mm. When uh, 10 years ago, we were talking about plant blindness and now, and it will look like some sort of fringe things to talk about. And now so many people know what plant blindness is and there are actually, you know, so many artistic and creative initiatives to, you know, cure or address plant blindness because they know that we are ready. And so I think actually change is already happening. And as often is the case, you only recognize it in hindsight. Yeah. So hopefully we will be able to say, wow, that was a wild ride and we made it. <laughs> I do agree wholeheartedly. And you've actually answered one of the whole list of questions I haven't gotten to about the meaning of history and where we're at at the moment. <laughs> But yes, and I agree totally. There is, I, I'm watching it, like the local permaculture school is just inundated. All of their courses selling out, having to put on extra courses. It's mm. on the tip of people's tongues. Even, Beautiful. you know, the psychedelic revival and medicinal application of That's it. That's right. All of it. Rewilding. Yep. It's actually a really exciting time to be alive and within these fields. That's right. And I guess maybe uh, the job that we have at this point is... Uh, uh, and again, I speak for myself, but when I interact with my science colleagues, I just remind myself that they're the ones that cannot see mm. the entire picture. 
you know, that they weren't stuck in linear time and they can only see what linear time allows them to see. And what, so it's almost like, well, they are in a trance. They, it's not their fault if they're so um, fixated into this position. Mm. Uh, so, but then it is a responsibility if you can see a little bit more it is then your responsibility to try and not tell, but show how it can be possible to have multi-universes present. And, you know, this is Viviero de Castro. It's like, uh, this doesn't mean that, uh, you know, this means that all perspectives are coexisting. Mm. They all are different worlds and they are all coexisting at the same time. And... Um, and then the place becomes a very interesting place to play. <laughs> this, this space is going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, well, then we go from this human experience where we feel like we are this lone orphan species to realise that we are in a Garden of Eden surrounded by brother and sister species. Absolutely. Monica, thank you. I've really enjoyed today's chat. Same. Before you go, could you let the listeners know where they can go to get hold of your work or see what you do? Uh, yeah, well, um, most of the things are on my website uh -huh. and it's uh, www.monicagagliano.com. And I guess the only other thing that maybe there is something that is coming up recent, like soon in April and maybe listeners are interested, it's free, uh, but you need to register. And it's a symposium. There is, um, it's one day on the 9th of April for us in Australia. And, mm -hmm. and it's going to be, I think, very rich because it's about the mind of plants. And there are some beautiful people coming to share. Uh, there are contributors who are given five minutes. Uh -huh. So they're not going to be there as the expert telling people. But it's more five minutes of right. like, their own personal experience in connection to the plant world. And there are so many perspectives because you have from artists to anthropologists to scientists to poets, uh, indigenous voices, young voices, all the voices. Uh, I think it's going to be beautiful. And so, yeah, if you feel like it, um, come de register and come online. And we have some things uh, that are interactive for people to actually get out of the uh, the office or the yeah. room where they're sitting in front of the screen and, and connect, really go and do something. So um, we're trying to make it as interactive as we can, given the, the constraints, but it should be fun. So if anybody wants to, they're welcome. Yeah, you know, I've registered for that. Is it the Mind of Plants Symposium? Was that right? Yep, that's right. Okay, great. All right. Well, Monica, thank you so much again. I really appreciate you taking the time. I've really enjoyed today's chat. It was awesome. Yeah. Thank you to you, Byron. I enjoyed it too. <laughs> okay. All the best. Have a good day. Ciao. See ya. Ciao. Two things I think you're ready now. Got a party, got a song. Leaking in for like a day.